Steve, thank you so much for coming on the Easy Prey podcast today. It's a pleasure to be with you today. So can you give myself and the audience a little background about who you are and what you do? Sure. I'm uh, retired from the Federal Trade Commission, where I worked for 34 years running the uh, Midwest region in Chicago. And since retiring, I've also done some in-depth studies uh, for the Better Business Bureau on common frauds that people encounter every day. And I am also do a weekly fraud newsletter, free one, goes out around the world uh, at bakerfraudreport.com. And so if anybody's interested in the newsletter, just go to the website. There's a sign up form there at bakerfraudreport.com. So I've been doing fraud for over 30 years. There's a whole lot of things that the Federal Trade Commission does, obviously. But it's something I've always really had a, been interested in and how it works and who's behind it and the international aspects of it. I even spent a few months as a federal prosecutor. Um, so it's a subject that is eminently practical because we're all being bombarded every day with spams, text message scams, bogus websites, and we all need to watch out and you know it affects everybody. So it's a really an important issue and I'm glad you're uh, glad you're doing a podcast on these things. Yeah, it's, it's been uh, very illuminating. Uh, so you talked about being at the FTC for 34 years and, and dealing with fraud. Was that a result of something that happened in your life or someone you know, or was that just the trajectory that your career ended up it taking? Was, it was the trajectory my career had done. We had just started at the Federal Trade Commission. Um, we just got the authority to go into federal court to freeze assets and have receivers appointed. That was one of the so I did one of the first big cases there. I was obviously an area that needed a lot of attention, and I've always remained interested since then. There's always something new. There's always more to learn, and uh, it's a huge area out there worldwide. Yeah, and I'm glad that you've decided to use uh, part of your retirement time uh, rather than golfing to uh, to help people. Um, like I say, it is. I wish I was knew how to play golf, but I'm not a golfer. But <laughs> uh, this keeps me busy, that's for sure. So let's uh, let's talk about the credit reporting system and uh, a little bit about that, and along with the uh, the Privacy Rights Institute that you're you're currently working with. Can you uh, tell us what that is and what it does? Sure. The Privacy Rights Institute is meant to educate people on their rights under credit reporting and making sure they really know what's going on. Um, so we are really taking a look at the credit reporting process. This is so important for all of us. I mean, people talk sometimes about big data, the worry about data brokers are gonna pull this information together best. That information is already there and it has been. And I don't think people realize just how extensive this is. Because every time you pay a bill, every time you apply for a loan, use your credit card, all that information gets reported to one of the big three credit reporting agencies. And they compile it in their credit report. And there are all sorts of people who can pull credit reports about us and learn about what we're doing and ways that are really going to affect our lives. For example, if I go to try to rent an apartment, they're going to, before they issue a lease, they're probably going to pull a credit report to see if I paid my bills on time, um, have I filed for bankruptcy before, have I got judgments against me, anything that's going to you know, interfere with my ability to lease the apartment. And that information is available for a few, few keystrokes on basically anybody that rents apartments in the United States. And I may not even know they're doing it. I may not even know that there's information in there. And there's a lot that can go wrong with credit reports, as you'd imagine, with billions of piece, pieces of data from hundreds of thousands of co companies reporting in different forms to the credit reporting agencies. Errors can and, and do work out. And there's also issues with unauthorized access, which leads to identity theft, which last time I looked was the number one source of complaints to the Federal Trade Commission. That happens a lot, unfortunately. So the, yeah, go ahead. So, so what kind of uh, data and information is on the credit reports that entities can get a hold of? Well, 
So the people that provide the data are called furnishers. So basically anybody you pay a bill to, whether it's Joe's Furniture down the street where you bought a couch or you're paying your credit card bills, paying your mortgage, um, uh, any, any other credit, that information is all going to go back in. In addition to public record stuff, such as bankruptcies or judgments against you, and that's all combined in their credit report about you in particular. Mm -hmm. And so that that is the information that the credit reporting agencies try to provide. They're a business. They sell that. I mean, it's a good system in many ways. I mean, so in the United States, I can go to a car dealership with just my ID, um, decide to buy a car, drive it away probably even finance it, and I don't have to bring in any financial documents at all. But the reason for that is because, and the reason for that is that they've got my credit report, so they know what's in it, and they can make a pretty good judge on whether I'm just a thief, somebody stealing the, the car or not. Um, on the other hand, um, that information, like I say, is can be cumbersome to compile, and errors can creep in, and some of the credit reporting agencies have had major data breaches. And like I say, I don't, I may not know what's going on. So where does it go wrong with respect to bad data and things about us that might not actually be correct? Well, several things can happen. Um, first of all, um, they can mix, mix up uh, the data with other people. So there could be two Chris Parker's in the same apartment complex, same name. They get the files mixed up and they get confused. I mean, they try to keep us straight with social security numbers, but not everybody requires those. And sometimes those don't get reported. Um, in addition, the people providing them with the data may be making errors. Mm -hmm. For example, Apple had a big issue a year or two ago where they were referring to all of their former employees as associates, which were not people's job data. So people were applying for jobs. The companies looked for verification of their income and salary and their job titles. And like, look, this person says they did X, but this says that they were just an associate. So they must not have been a very serious employee. And there was a class action over that. And the other other data from the furnishers may end up being accurate, inaccurate. And the problem with that is that um, you don't even know it, that they were what they were reporting about you. Um, sometimes they're they they're supposed to get permission first before they get verification of employment. Um, but they don't always do that. And sometimes it's just fine print. So people don't even know what it is they're signing over. Um, the way this system is supposed to work is that if they pull a credit report or look at or, or, or other information about you, like verifying your income and decide not to hire you um, or to charge you more for credit than they normally would because of something in your credit report, they're supposed to send you a notification um, and an opportunity to get a free copy of your credit report so you can go fix it. Mm -hmm. But by that time, you've already lost out the job. And, and going back to the, so, I mean, it's a real problem and the credit reporting agencies are not necessarily real good about fixing real errors. Is some of that, you know, from the consumer's perception, credit reporting agencies are, you know, why, why are these entities doing this to me? Why, aren't, you know, I'm a customer. Why aren't they treating me better? Is the issue is that we as consumers really aren't the customer? And, and so maybe they don't have as much motivation to, if I'm saying, hey, this is wrong. Well, you're not really, you know, am I really their customer? Well, I think that is a problem. At one time they were leaning towards changing that incentive structure a little bit because they were charging people for credit reports. Now they've got to, so they are making money from, from consumers. Um, but no customer service is, is, is bad. I, I, it just is. I mean, it is across the board automated system. It's a cost of hiring real people. People don't want to do it. 
and we got automated systems and, and, and errors happen. And the feedback that comes back sometimes is, is really poor for the consumer financial protection bureau says that they get more over half of all the complaints that go to them and they regulate the banks and credit card companies mm -hmm. over half of all their complaints are about the three credit reporting agencies wow so it is really really huge they've got a long history of bad customer service um partly they blame that on credit repair companies um, claiming that they're tied up dealing with all sorts of frivolous disputes, which in some ways they are, but people just don't want to spend the money. I found customer service is really a problem. I found when I was at the FTC that we were investigating companies uh, for different practices, like false made in the USA claims. And we asked them for their complaints that they'd received from consumers about this issue. And they're like, oh, we don't have any. And then we get into litigation. Turns out they have thousands of complaints. They just don't pay any attention to them. And no. it always made me crazy. If you're a business, and these same businesses will go out and hire people to do consumer surveys and other studies on consumer satisfaction. And they've got free feedback from their own customer complaint system that's just, you know, Agnes stuck in a corner of the basement somewhere. And nobody pays attention to her. And she's got all this free data inside. It always made me crazy. The companies don't pay more attention to their complaint systems than they do. Yeah. And I think with, with credit reporting agencies, you know, if, if I'm a business and I'm paying them X, X dollars for every, every request that I do, I think they're more inclined to respond if I have an issue with their platform versus a consumer who is not paying them any money. Well, that could well be. And, and it's a difficult issue but i mean real problems really do occur the other thing of course that can happen is if you've got people at every car dealership in the country with a terminal where they can pull up credit reports you know what's to keep them from checking out somebody they know or yeah. or, or pulling a credit report inappropriately that can certainly happen it's a crime but you know i'm sure that people don't realize that and i'm sure it happens from time to time um so yeah, no, it's it, it's a real problem. The other thing, of course, is data breaches. Um, Equifax had a data breach several years ago, where the hackers got the information on 150 million customers from from their systems. Uh, um, I was one of them. <laughs> yeah, and the other credit, well, at least Experian has had a couple incidents like that too, because you can imagine hackers are desperate for this information. And if you've got somebody's this personal information, then you can do identity theft and you can apply for credit cards in somebody's name or you can get a you know mortgage on somebody's house. Um, and it, that can screw people up, you know, even if it isn't going to end up costing you money, it's still hundreds of hours sometimes to straighten these situations out. And there's a worldwide network of crooks out there that are working every day just to get that sort of information and the, it's worth a lot of money. And, and so it's not just, you know, some, some guy in a basement, you know, the, the infamous uh, hacker in a hoodie in a basement, just trying to, to have a little fun, but these are legitimate criminal enterprise organizations with hundreds or thousands of people. That's right. No, I think people have that sort of view or they think of some sort of teenager in a cyber cafe or, or whatever, but these are real international organized crime gangs. And sometimes they're foreign governments. I've seen speculation that the Equifax breach was actually done by China. Um, and, and and I can't say it wasn't. Um, it certainly could happen. So these are big organized crime gangs. They can sell information on the dark web um, and for massive amounts of money. Well, the Los Angeles school system just had hackers uh, get into their system um, it was a ransomware where effort where they locked up and encrypted all their data and LA refused to pay. And now they're starting taking all these records on, on all sorts of students and staff and dumping them on the internet. Mm. And this is such this dark web stuff is scary. I mean, I recently saw an article suggested I could get, you know, your credit card number for 15 cents. No. Oh. 
by now. So it's so uh, so there's there's a whole lot out there. And so the data security part is really important. In addition, of course, the people that provide the data to the credit reporting agencies are also can and often are hacked. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of information out there uh, floating around about us, around about us. And we just really need to know and understand how this credit reporting system works so that we can try to protect ourselves and, and try to get more better information from them about what they're doing. And a chance to look at the data and make sure it's right before people make decisions about what to do with us. So you were talking earlier about uh, like employment lookups and, and employment verification. Is that part of the existing credit system or is that a, a separate uh, business, different entities? It, it is the same entities that are doing that. They sell it. I guess if you just want to verify your employment and uh, um, salary, um, they can. That's a little bit in, cheaper than buying a full credit report. But it is. There's a question, really. Um, some researchers at Stanford have been looking at on because Equifax buys that data. I think from over half the employers in the country, and they've got information on more than half of us. And they can sell just that information. Now, they claim they segregate that from their full credit reports, mm -hmm. but they've been a little bit iffy in terms of response, and nobody can really tell if that's really true, that they're keeping that separate or not. Uh, but you should know that that's going to happen. There is, there are, There are some alternatives that are starting to emerge out there. For example, one has a secure lockbox, so your employer that they, your employer gives to you, they load your employment information and salary into that. You can't change it yourself, mm -hmm. and then you can share the key to that box with potential employer or somebody else, so they can take a look at it. And the advantage, of course, you've had a, you know it's there. You've had a chance to take a look at it. You decide you who you want to share it with, and I think people would be happier with that sort of arrangement because they know what's going on with their data and yeah. they know what data is actually being shared. And we, I, I suppose we, we'd love to have that same thing with our, with our credit data as well, not just, uh, you know, freezing and unfreezing it to allow someone to do a check in order for it as to get an auto loan. But if they're just selling it to, uh, you know, to other businesses who are looking for uh, credit worthy people in a particular zip code, We'd love to have control over that as well. Yes, you would. And we, so that's what we're advocating today. People have a little bit more control over their data and awareness of how their data is being used because it really can affect us in real life, especially you know now with people needing more credit and the economy starting up and people, a lot of people are changing jobs and moving around and at least exploring new jobs um, with inflation and after the pandemic so it's a real issue so are there are there laws being are there entities working on new laws to kind of rein in the credit reporting agencies and give us a little bit more control over what they can and can't do with our data well there's uh we would we would like to see that there's also some 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 new business models that are starting to develop that sounds a little bit more consumer friendly um and um and we're, well, we're just trying to create awareness of what else is going on out there. Um, enforcement, enforcement. I mean, laws without enforcement aren't very effective. Yeah. The, uh, for example, I mentioned credit repair before. California has the strict, strict, most stringent credit repair laws in the country, but the state doesn't really enforce them. And California also had the most credit repair companies <laughs> in the country, um, which is going on. But lawsuits under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, which governs this, this system of credit reports, um, have tripled over the last 10 years. Mm. Um, errors come in. You know, People are just looking at data, not understanding what they've got. I think systems get their wires tangled. And um, you know, sometimes the companies... It's a bit of an oligopoly, really. You've really only got TransUnion, Equifax, 
and uh, Experian are the three companies that sell credit reports mm -hmm. and maintain most of this credit report information on us. And and so what can so what should consumers be doing in order to uh, find out if there are errors on their credit report and if they do, what can they do about it? Okay. So the by law has been a law for a while that you can get a copy of your credit report once a year. Uh, since there's three companies, you could get one every four months and know and, and know what's in your credit report. So the place to go is annualcreditreport.com. Um, that is run through the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, you can get all three credit reports there. Don't go to alternatives. I mean, the FTC actually sued one of the credit reporting agencies some years ago because they were offering a free credit report that ended up being a free subscription that you had to cancel. And then they were also trying to push other products and services that people didn't really necessarily need. So go to annualcreditreport.com, get a copy of your credit report and take a look at it. Um, I said that you could get one per year, but during, since, as a result of the pandemic, until December of 2023, you can get any of them free anytime you want. Oh, that's good. Um, so I would definitely do that. Try to make sure it's accurate. And then if you have problems, go to the go to one of the credit reporting agencies. If you report inaccuracies to one, they're supposed to share that with the other two. So you've got a standard form. You don't have to do as much work to, 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 to fix errors as you used to. Um, be aware that sometimes these companies are hard to get a hold of on the phone. And um, report to the cons Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, CFPB.gov, if you can't get any help from the credit re re reporting agency. Um, it is, you'd be su really surprised at how many mistakes there are. And sometimes people look to their credit report and there's like credit, you know, the, your, you've got a credit card in Ghana and you didn't even, you've never been there, you never talked to anybody before, you know, something, something's going on that somebody's using your credit. The related thing is look at your credit card bills and phone bills. A lot of people don't. And they're astonished. I mean, there was a while where the phone companies were allowing third parties to bill us for stuff on the phone bill. Yeah. We didn't even know it was there. I mean, we had one of our attorneys in the Chicago FTC office who had been paying like 20 bucks a month for a year for something she didn't even know she had. Um, so you, it's it's really important to pay attention to these sorts of things. Yeah, I, I remember there was, a, there was a period of time when those... Uh, what they call it, slamming, I think, uh, you know, a adding stuff to your phone bill when, when the, the the common advice was anytime you're talking to someone on the phone that you don't know, don't say yes, <laughs> because they might record it and use that as proof that uh, you authorize the, this additional charge on your credit, on your, uh, on your phone bill. <laughs> yeah, no, that does happen. We actually went in, uh, raided one boiler room in Florida and uh, they got little tape recordings of people trying to get them to verify the credit card charge so that if the person came back and said, hey, this, this was fraudulent uh, and challenged the credit card charge, they could get their money back. But they were actually doctoring those tapes. And they had a little, they had a little chart by their answering machine explaining how to do it for oh. the dumb employees. So we knew that that was really what was going on. Um, that's... You know, brings us to another point, which is really good. I was surprised with one of the studies I did for the BBB when we found out that only about half the people in the country realize they can charge, they can get their money back on credit card charges they didn't authorize. Wow. Or if it's a result of fraud. A tremendous amount of people don't realize that. Instead, they they call the company, the scam company, try to get your money back. They're not going to give your money back. Um, you know, just charge it back on your credit card. And a lot of people just don't know that they can do that. Um, and they really do need to know that because a really useful piece of day-to-day -day advice. Yeah, I, I, I generally have always operated on the, if I see a suspicious charge, 
uh, yeah, obviously, I check with my wife and see if she bought something that I didn't realize, which is about 99% of the time, one of us has done something that the other one wasn't aware of in the moment or the, the number didn't come out to be exactly what we thought it was. But I don't know that I've ever actually, I've definitely had charges that I didn't recognize on my card, but I don't think I've ever actually even tried to figure out who the charge was from. Actually, I, I did once or twice try to figure it out, but I, I definitely didn't try to call them to get the refund. I'm like, I'm I, I'm yeah. going to go someone who 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 is who's going to act in my interest and just just you know reverse the charge and let them figure it out. Yeah, we we I think we yeah you know, we did the suing one operation of the Federal Trade Commission, and so it was like 10, 15 cent charges, oh. hundreds of thousands of them, and we finally traced it back to the island of Cyprus, which mm. is fairly the gateway corridor for Russian organized crime, and. Um, I lost the trail after that, but it was these people were collectively getting massive amounts of money and just very little doubts. And you look at your credit card bill, eh, 15 cents, you know, it's not even worth the time to make a phone call. And they're raking in millions from this sort of stuff. F 15 cents across uh, hundreds of millions of people will get you a lot of money. Yeah, so well. So are there any benefits of using like uh, credit cards versus debit cards? They work a little bit differently. Um, I always use a credit card. I know I can charge back if it is. There's a little bit of a different system with uh, with debit cards, but 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 you can charge back against debit cards too. People should should be aware of that. Um, the big problem out there. Well, I mean, it's a whole other topic we could do for another day. But you've got this. One of the things that's always interesting. I always find interesting is how do scammers get your money? I mean, no point in running a scam if you can't get paid. Um, so they want the money. And recently, the number one way of getting your money is through cryptocurrency. Yeah. Um, so there's all this thousands of these Bitcoin ATMs around. My local gas station um, has got one. So you just plunk in $50 bills, they send you a QR code on your phone, you hold it up to the screen, and your money is gone. And you have no idea where in the world it just went to. But that is the number one way for, for, for is for using crypto. Um, the, other, the second most popular is gift cards. Yep. People don't know that if you give them the number off the back of your gift card, that's as good as just giving them the card. They don't need the card, um, and it can be gone and nothing flat. Um and, and no government agency accepts gift cards as a, a as a form of payment. Well, that's right. No, that's exactly <laughs> right. And there's a lot of people out there calling people claiming they are the U.S. government, often Social Security or the IRS. Um, sometimes immigration, customs, threatening people, you know, the with deportation, um, particularly hitting recent immigrants really pretty hard. Um, so the, so that's a problem too. Um, so the other thing with credit reports is I don't know how they deal with issues. I mean, if I'm here from illegally from Nicaragua and I want a job, I got to have a social security number, right? Well, I can't just pull one out of thin air. I'm probably using somebody else's and, 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 and that could end up, it could be yours. And so it would be worth to try to find out if, if that's going on. And I wonder just how much of it really does happen. That could be a real problem. On the one hand, the immigrant has got a, somebody else's social security number. You know, maybe they're paying into social security, even though they're never going to be able to collect it. I don't know. That's, that's a potentially massive out, issue out there that doesn't get talked about. Mm -hmm. Um and of course, the other thing that goes on is that there are government benefits like the COVID PPP loans or unemployment benefits. And people from scammers from around the world have stolen tens of billions of dollars from those things applying online. And finding people and get the money back is, is, is not an easy thing to do. Well, and, the, and those things have protect, potential tax implications for... You know, if, if someone took out a PP loan and even repaid it or didn't, 
or got COVID relief funds under my name, some of those are, uh, you still owe the taxes on them. Well, that's yes. right. And how do you even know if someone, I, I think we'll find that out here the next couple of years of how many of those happen as people start getting audits and get notified by the government, hey, you didn't pay the taxes on your PPP loan or you didn't pay the taxes on the COVID relief funds. And you're like, I didn't get anything. Right. And and we'll we'll start seeing that uh, come to fruition here in the next few years. Yeah. So again, I think keep an eye on your credit stuff, particularly your credit reports, knowing what's in there, and making sure there aren't any errors um, is is really something we all need to do. Um, and it's not necessarily all that difficult to do. Like I say, you can get it for free right now for the next year or so. But do take a look. Do do complain, speak out as always. We always encourage. I always encourage everybody to speak out if you've been ripped off. Don't blame yourself. Don't feel guilty. Don't get guilty. Get mad and 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 speak out about it. And let the I, enforcement agencies know too. I like that. Uh, any other resources we should be directing people to before we uh, round uh, finish off here today? Um, the only thing it might be worth mentioning is credit repair. Mm -hmm. um, because there, if you really do have bad credit, first of all, a couple of things people need to know. The creditors really mostly care about what's happened to you in the last year or two. Um, not historically really bad problems. Um, they can report uh, bad credit stuff for seven years on credit reports and bankruptcies for 10. But like I say, they're only really interested in the the, the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. And so you can become credit worthy again. Most people can fairly, fairly rapidly. Um, but the, there are credit repair companies. We've all heard them on the radio. They advertise bad credit. We can fix it. Um, a tremendous. Of, we've sued hundreds of those operations when I was at the Federal Trade Commission. Actually, I just saw a guy plead guilty to, to, to today. I just saw a press release. Um, so the, their company had claimed that they had paralegals, they could get bad information off your credit report, and they claimed to have a team of lawyers and paralegals, and they did, basically. Oh. They just, they can't do it. So what credit repair companies really do is they just challenge every bit of information on your credit report or claim, which you probably didn't tell them, that you're an ID theft victim. Mm -hmm. And so the credit reporting agencies have to take that information off temporarily while they re-verify it. But of course, since there's no documentation and it really isn't, then you know they can't they can't fix it. Um, there was one credit repair company one time that said they could remove bankruptcies, and what they were doing was going into the clerk of court's office of the bankruptcy court and stealing credit, stealing court files. Oh my goodness! Um, which I couldn't couldn't believe. But mostly, what these guys do is they just write blunderbuss letters challenging all information on the credit report. They can't fix your credit, and they are incredibly, incredibly common. Um, so I really urge people to be aware of those, and they're all over the internet. We all hear them on the radio and TV. Yeah. And and there's a federal law, the fair the um sorry, uh yeah, credit repair organizations act, which they prohibits them from taking any money from you until you don't have to pay them unless they can achieve results. Mm -hmm. Um and they all violate that because none of them can do it and they're all gonna take money in advance. So again, if anybody's fallen victim to a credit repair scam we really urge you to step out, step up and report that. And not only civil cases like the Federal Trade Commission does, but now there's apparently been some criminal cases and that would do a whole lot of good for everybody. Because by definition, the victims of these credit repair stuff are people with bad credit. Yeah. Often because of not their own fault, divorces, death in the family or something like that. And they get really behind on their bills. They can't pay them. And then you got these credit repair guys who come in and take what little money they've got left. So it's, it's always been one of my bugaboos. Yeah. It's, it's when pick, when people have fallen victim to one thing, whether it's legitimate, whether it was a legitimate 
credit issue or not, people are going to try to take advantage of that vulnerable state and, and yeah. make life worse for them. Off, mm-hmm. Awful way to go. Uh, Steve, if people want to find you online, where can they find you online? Um, go to, I've got a website at bakerfraudreport.com. Um, or if they want to sign up for the newsletter, they can send me an email at steve at bakerfraudreport.com. And I'm happy to sign them up. Price is right. It's free. And uh, you'll learn about what's going on out there and be able to talk to your friends and neighbors about what kind of frauds that they ought to be looking out for and what they need to warn their family members about. Yep. Steve, thank you so much for coming on the Easy Prey podcast today. It's been a pleasure.